there where I wouldn't even care like how I did my hair and, and stuff. I just basically run out in a tracksuit and just basically just get to work and get to grafting. So you have 14 Airbnb properties. I was at the cash point in Birmingham. I took some money out, my friend was just standing there behind me and she saw my balance. It was literally around like £300 that I had. And she was like, Usman, you're making around like, let's say 1,200 and more per month. Where's your money going? It was the biggest embarrassment I'd ever felt. The actual guests came into the property while the works were going on. The builder's stuff is all lying around. There were some wires that hadn't been boxed off yet. It still smelled like paint. And the whole house was a tip. Just before you go on to Airbnb, first tell me, did you manage save up 20 grand. See, one of the biggest things that people don't do is think. You have to take ownership of your life. Welcome back to my channel where we discuss property, business, lifestyle and well-being. If this is the first time you are visiting my channel, then please hit the like and subscribe button. On today's episode, I have Uzma, who is only 21 years old. She's from Coventry. She has 14 Airbnbs. She's on target for this year to reach 50 Airbnbs. I can't wait to speak with her today and see how she got started. And, and you know what, if you want to, like I always say to my guests, you want to take your shoes off, you want to socks on, <laughs> it's like you're at home. And I'm at BBC, That's I'm just, good. Like, so, yeah. It's really good. So how was your journey? Good? Yeah, it was good, but guess what? Basically, so I actually... You didn't book, you booked last minute. That's what happens when you yeah, book last no, minute. Yeah, no, 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 no. I booked it in the more... Um, in the morning, basically last night I felt really ill. Yeah. After I spoke to you, yeah. well before I spoke to you, I had two uh, two ibuprofens, and then I spoke to you, and then later on that night again, I had some two, another two, <laughs> and I was just like really ill last night, mm. and I was like, oh my god, what's what's gonna happen? Am I gonna be able to go? And yeah. I still don't feel well, but I was like, I ha you know, let's sort something. I'll have to, I'll have to do it. Um, and then yeah, so I booked it, yeah. and I was actually supposed to arrive here at half six. Yeah. But me being lastminute.com, even with getting ready, <laughs> it meant that my flight, um, not my flight, sorry, the train was delayed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so instead of it even being 7 8, I got here at 7 30. It's didn't cool. I? It's cool, Dory. How did we connect? Um, Zayma. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Zayma. I think she, Zayna or Zayma. Zayma. Um, yeah, so she's from Coventry originally. Oh, so she's I know from her Lawrence, sister. isn't she? Yeah, so I know her sister. Uh, Which one? Rabia. She came with one of her friend, one of her sisters. Hmm. I know the younger one only yeah. because she's like a mutual. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I actually think I did I did Zayma's eyebrows because oh, I used to do I used to be a hard grafter like before property and everything. I used to like I was working a nine to five job. I was doing other you know side hustles and stuff, and I was doing eyebrows. One of them was doing eyebrows, and yeah. she came down to my uh, to my house, my mom's house, and I did eyebrows. Uh, that one time, so that's how I know her basically. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Thank you for coming down, Osma. You've travelled from Coventry. Um, how would you currently introduce yourself to my audience? How would I introduce myself? Yeah. Um, so, of course, my name is Osma Patel. Um, I'm 21 years old mm -hmm. from Coventry, and I specialise, well, yeah, I specialise in rent to rent, uh, two service accommodation. So, Basically, when I say service accommodation, everyone, most people are like, what does that mean? Yeah. But it's essentially Airbnb, um, yeah. alternative, hotel alternative, basically. Okay, so you're 21. Like, I'm personally, I'm super impressed by what you've done so far from what I see and, you know, speaking to you yesterday. I feel like you're crushing it. So let me take you, I just want to go back to, because you're only 21 years old, to when you first, like, had a job. How old was you? Yes, so... Um, Couldn't have been that long ago. I'm trying to think of my first job. So my first ever job, actually, um, goes back to... I was actually working for free with my mum, like, growing up. Yeah. Um, you know, she used to have all these, like, I think you call it blue-collar jobs, where, you know, you're working 
for literally five pound an hour. You go to someone's house and you're cleaning someone's house. Mm. Um, my mum was working at you know uh, bakeries as well, so I'd go there help out. She was working at uh, restaurants. I'd go and help out as well for free. So really free. Yeah. So I don't know if it's class as a job, but growing up, I've always been around uh, that kind of working environment where I was allowed to actually be working. You know, as a twelve-year-old, let's say you you wouldn't be allowed. Um, but since and you know since I was quite young, I've always been around that kind of uh, that kind of world as exposed to. Um, it was nice, of course, growing up watching that. And then um, as soon as I was allowed to start working, yeah. I was 16. I um, think after I left year, year 11. So after you'd say, you know, prom and, you know, GCSEs, um, I started working at catering. So like waitressing for weddings and events and stuff like that. Again, you know, it's not a very nice job, but you had to start somewhere. So literally again, five pound an hour for that job. Uh, for myself, but it gave me a bit more independence and freedom. Um, growing up, growing up, of course, my mum wasn't really. We don't come from a well-off family, so everything I had to always ask my mum. And knowing me, um, I'm quite high maintenance. <laughs> okay. So you know, um, I like. I like. I do tend to buy some expensive things like what other people wouldn't normally buy. So for example, my face wash at 16 years old, I was, I was spending like 20 pound on face washes, spending like 50 pounds on like face creams. And like, I was really into my skincare and um, taking that, taking, looking after myself basically. Um, so yeah, of course it does, it's not cheap and I didn't want to burden my mum with that. So uh, being independent, making my own money, very important to myself. So yeah, I started working on 16 at Waitressing and then, um, Stopped that for a while uh, during sixth form and then COVID hit. I went into, I didn't have a job for like a year and I think um, around that time it was a very low point in my life. Um, I think at that time I was around 17, 18, I'd say 18. Mm. And um, you know, everyone's left with predicted grades during COVID and everyone had a plan, you know, everyone in my year had a plan they were going to go to university. Um, they knew what they were doing, but me, I'd never, I never applied for university ever. Um, or oh, did you not? No, I never wanted to go into university. So it was just like COVID was, was unexpected. Everything was just starting to be so like, so so many changes were happening at the same yeah, time. Yeah. And um, within about, it was about a year. Um, yeah, like I said, it was a very hard time in my life because. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a direction in mm. life. Uh, I just kind of remember the days passing by every single day and doing the same kind of stuff every single day. Were you 17? Again again. Yeah, 17, 18. I said 18 yeah, yeah, yeah. to be exact. What made you not go uni? What, what made you think like, I'm definitely not going uni? Yeah, so the courses that I'd always, you know, look at in terms of university was always, I was really into skincare growing up. Okay. So um, I had acne when I was a little girl. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of girls deal with acne, a lot of boys deal with acne. Mm. Um, and I always wanted to do something related to skin. But then I, I started doing a bit more research into it and, it and it requires you to go to, let's say, university. I wanted to be a dermatologist. Um, and it, again, it just requires a lot of money. Even with um, going to university for like a one or two year like apprenticeship or something, I don't know. Um, even that required a lot of money. Um, not apprenticeship, sorry. What, what would you call it? Like a, like a course, basically. Yeah, yeah, like to basically become course. the dermatologist. Like a level one, level two, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, um, In terms of skincare specialists, hmm. you still, again, needed to pay quite a bit to these colleges, universities to get involved. Um, and it just never made sense to me because what you'd be getting out of it um, didn't sound a lot. Okay. Right, so as days are going, weeks are going, months are going, COVID kicks in, yeah? So you said you was at your lowest point. So yeah. at, at that point, like, what, what's made you think, like, what happened next? Yeah, good question. So um, COVID hit um, and everyone around me, like all my friends were still working in their jobs. So whether it was, I've had a few friends working at Primark, um, you know, just just normal jobs where you're not getting paid a lot, but mm. it, it's it's something steady keep you to keep you going. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some of my friends are working at JD, um, some in retail like Morrison's and stuff like that. But myself, I didn't have a job, and I don't know why I wasn't able to get a job. I'd always put my applications through, uh, but I wasn't getting accepted. And of course, um, why do you think that was? <laughs> I, I have no idea. But around during COVID, I think it was quite hard to get 
a job. Everyone was getting furloughed. Everyone, yeah, you know, with true. these in these big uh, industries, like for mm. example, working for Jaguar Land Rover and stuff, they were now having to go back to work in the retail because they were making made furloughed. Um, but yeah, I don't know why it was I wasn't getting accepted for these jobs, but um, I, it kind of limited me in terms of. Um, what I was able to do during my summer holidays, it limit, limited me um, in terms of experiences as well. And I started to realise like you need money for literally everything. Even when you're going out, you know, with your friends or going out for literally anything, money is going to be spent. And I kept looking um, and I used to go to Costco a lot to do some shopping. Costco. Costco. The, the, the wholesale warehouse. place. Yeah, yeah. yeah my yeah, mum yeah, used yeah. to go there for shopping. Okay. I just one day picked up the CV, filled it out, get back. And then a few days later, I got called in for an interview. Right. Before that, actually, I was working in a restaurant, again, £5 an hour. Um, it just wasn't a nice job. Because you just job. needed some dough in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. But yeah, when, it, when I moved into working at Costco, that was £10 an hour. Um, but even then, this was before my, like, the biggest mindset shift mindset shift I had in my life so far um, where I was working at Costco but yeah. I was still spending it recklessly um, you know kind of to make others happy you'd kind of spend all the money and most your friends see, you mean yeah just 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 to kind of um, feel like you know you have money you, you got have, you, you've got you've got money to spend and you know you're able to do this and able to do that and then there was one day where me and my friend went out during COVID again um, to a restaurant and I was there withdrawing some money. Um, so I think my meal cost around £20 or something like that. But I was at the cash point in Birmingham, we went to Grills um, and I took some money out. My friend was just standing there behind me and she saw my balance. It was literally around like £300 that I had and I was working for, let's say, five, five months four or five months. And she was like, Usman, you're making around like, let's say 1,200 and more per month. Where's your money going? Why do you only have 300 pounds? Yeah. And that's when I was actually really, really embarrassed. It actually, um, it, it paid a lot on my mind. Um, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like it means a lot um, to, to the average person, but for myself, it was the biggest embarrassment I'd ever felt. Um, and, it made me feel out of place as well. It made me feel like I wasn't doing it enough compared to people in my in in my kind of in my year. Uh, peop, um, really, even at that age? Yeah, at at eighteen, I really it made me feel really low um, because you know growing up from a, a background where other people were more privileged than me, um, you know, council house background myself, um, and it's just a very embarrassing thing. Again, it just added to that extra embarrassment. Um, it really hurt and um, that's where I think I kind of got serious about the next year so that was I think 2019 mm. and then going into 2020 um, January I think that's where my my goals began really really so that's yeah. when you flicked the switch yeah okay so before we get into the Airbnb business do you want to some water? Have yeah. Some water, yeah so before you got into the Airbnb business did you have any other business? Did you do any? You mentioned something about eyebrows. Yeah. Where does that come in? Tell me. Yeah. So. Um, or was this first second? Yeah. So um, during so after you know the embarrassment from like you know my friend only seeing three hundred pounds mm. in my bank account, it paid a lot. It paid a lot on my mind. Yeah. Um, I think it was literally the um, the thirty first of December, twenty nineteen. Still the same year, and I was literally just dreading what 2020 would bring for me. And there was a lot of uncertainty and I had a lot of big goals for myself. Um, my goal was to save £20,000 um, in that year. Um, and growing up as an 18 year old, um, for me that was a really big figure. But at the same time, um, it didn't feel like a lot because I searched on Google, like what's the average, what's the kind of top 10% of the richest people, like wealthy, wealthy people in my age group, how much do they have in their bank account? Uh, because I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to let my past and the kind of environment I grew up in dictate my future. And, mm. and so I wanted to always be in that top kind of percentage. Um, so 20K for myself, that was the goal I set. Um, and yes, yeah, so I was working for 10 pound an hour 
at Costco. I was doing eyebrows, started it off at like literally four pounds, sitting on my bedroom floor with a little uh, blanket. People would come, I'd do the eyebrows for four pounds, take me one hour to do them because I'm a very uh, perfectionist and what I kind of offered in terms of eyebrow shaping, uh, people that charge one pound or two pound, on, they do it literally in one minute. Um, I was doing a bit, I was going the extra mile, making sure it's all symmetrical and stuff. So, And you were charging four quid? I was charging four quid when I first started in January. And it wasn't a thing where I actually put that business out there. I just had an eyebrow page. I do my family and friends' eyebrows and um, someone reached out to me during COVID. A lot of the shops were closed. So this girl reached out to me saying, could you do my eyebrows? And during COVID, I let people into my house. And my parents were, of course, and my siblings were like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I let them into my house and I was doing the eyebrows because I just really needed that money. You and I, money, yeah. Um, so yeah, I started off with four pounds. And by the end of the year, I think I, I slowly increased it to about 10 to 12 pounds. People from around the UK were traveling, literally from London, uh, different places, just to come to my little two, three bed house, council house in Coventry in a mm. block of, you know, in a block of flats and stuff. Um, just to get eyebrows done, because everything the eyebrows was locked done. off. Yeah, everything was locked off. So uh, that was one of my side hustles. And then, uh, so I was doing that whilst working at Costco. And then I also had another side hustle, uh, which was reselling. So I started off, I think, by like selling all my old clothes um, that I wasn't wearing. So I just kind of decluttering my wardrobe, trying to get that extra five, 10 pound. Because in my head, it was like, this five ten pound, I'm making it sitting in the comfort of my room, just posting something online, and I basically worked an hour. But I haven't, I haven't had to stand up, I haven't had to commute anywhere, I haven't had to do anything. I'm just posting something online, and I have this object, um, you know, sitting in, in my wardrobe. Might as well sell it. Might as well do something. Mm. So I started seeing that these, you know, these things were starting to sell, um, and then I branched out to uh, reselling phones. Reselling air fryers. What do you mean reselling? I don't understand what that means. Does that mean like Amazon FBA? Or no. What's that? What's reselling? Reselling. So, um, yeah, if if you do if you're taking it to that kind of high level, yes, you could do it on Amazon FBA. You post it on Amazon, but I was just just posting it on Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook. So I wasn't doing it as a proper business. It was just a side hustle. So you're getting stock from somewhere and just reselling it. Yeah. So Got it. I was okay. working at Costco, and you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to resell items from the place that you work because it's that con conflict of interest. Uh, but as I was working there, and I see that some air fryers come in, I'd buy two or three. I'd get in, I'd, I'd get a lot of suspicion from my from my uh, supervisors, like, oh, why are you buying two and three? Like you buy quite a few. You know, you're not allowed to sell them. Are you selling them? But they'd always be on my case. But I was like, no, I'm not doing anything dodgy. Don't worry about me, kind of thing. Uh, but I was reselling them, yeah. Uh, so like phones that you know in Costco, you, they kind of get reduced to six hundred pound once. If someone literally brings them back, uh, brings the product back just because they don't want it, the packaging is open, mm. literally still in pristine condition, they'll reduce the price, uh, wow. you know, instantly. And I'd price it to let's say it was one thousand pounds worth. Costco was selling it to six hundred. I'd price it at eight hundred, made it to two hundred pounds. Two hundred, yeah. Yeah. So uh, for myself, it kind of really helped me to get to that goal of twenty k. And um, you know, every bit of money that I made, I literally saved every single penny. Um, to the point that you know, with the twenty k that got the goal that I had in mind, I backtracked it per month. So I divided it by twelve, um, and then saw what I needed per month, and I saw how much was going to come from my. Um, my job, when I, my nine to five, you can say warehouse job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much was going to come from my eyebrow business and how much was going to come from my reselling. And if there's anything else I needed to do, even if it was like £10 less hmm. than my goal that month, I'd make sure I hit it, made sure. Impressive. Yeah. Okay, 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 wow. So before you got into the Airbnb then, because I presume that would have been your next move, right? Did you get educated anywhere about Airbnb? No. You didn't? No. Wow. So the reason why I went into Airbnb is because, um, you know, when I saved the 20K, I was thinking in my head, okay, with this amount, I'll be able to now buy a house. Um, but I think without being educated on how much it actually takes to buy a property, mm. I was kind of living in a fantasy world where you can mm. buy a property for 20K. Maybe, <coughs> yeah, you, you, I don't, I don't, you, I don't think you can with 20k, if I'm, I'm honest with you. Yeah, you can get like... Down, down north, you know, uh, Teesside. You, you as know, a deposit. Yeah, as a deposit, yeah, you yeah. know, and it's going to be a really run-down property as well. You're going to need a lot of work. N now that I'm in the property game, I kind of understand that. But back then, I was thinking I'd be able to get a new build house, uh, quite good <laughs> location. <laughs> Look at you laughing. But I thought I'd be able to get a very good uh, property for 20k. Um, and in my head, that was like financially free yeah yeah yeah. but yeah. then it's not financially free when you think about it because 
No, but that's just what you thought, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a liability. Um, it's not an asset because you're living in it. Mm. Unless I were to rent it out. But my goal, and anyone's goal really, when, you're, when you come from that kind of background where, you know, you're living in a council house, etc., mm. is to get financially free. You can't go and buy a house. It doesn't make sense. You've jumped so many different uh, steps and you just bought a house, you're now still stuck at work in, in, in whatever job you were mm -hmm. at. Um, so I just didn't believe in buying a house when I got to the 20K, I was thinking, what should I do with it now? Um, and um, that's where the Airbnb side comes into it. So Just before you go on to Airbnb, first tell me, did you manage to save up 20 grand? Pay attention, I've got some exciting news for you guys. I've launched a seven day free, total free audio course for you guys, which is gonna help you improve and elevate your mindset. And it's also gonna help you in your business. All you have to do is go and sign up every single day, day one to day seven, you will receive a free two minute audio from me in my own words, in my voice. And what that will do is help you in your business and your mindset. Make sure you go and sign up and let me know how you find it. You did? Well done. So you hit yeah. that target within a year? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I did hit the target. Um, a lot of people think that it's not possible, but it, it is. Um, but I w the thing is, I wasn't paying my mum any money. And yeah, I, I wasn't paying any rent. Uh, we'd have a lot of arguments, though. Um, you know, she, she wasn't working around that time, and she kind of knew that I had this IRA business going on. Um, I was reselling, I was working at you know Costco she knew I was making some kind of money and I think she of course wanted a bit of that which which a parent, a parent is entitled to that however at that point I felt like I didn't have anything to give like even when I got to 10k I was like I'm still broke um so she did your mum didn't know that you had 10k saved um no I wouldn't tell anyone <laughs> no because um as soon as anyone was to find out it's always like oh she's got money let me spend it and and I feel like everyone in my family, um, growing up, they weren't really good at money management. So like my parents, sorry, my parents weren't really good at money management. I don't think anyone is, to be honest. And, and for me to kind of escape what my mum, the life that my mum has kind of had, had created mm. for us, kid, us children, although she wishes the best for us, of course, I had to kind of keep it to myself, work on myself, get myself to where I wanted to be and then I'd give back to her but she never understood that so we had, we had a lot of arguments in that, that year of 2020 So where was your money like? Was it cash or was it like in the banks? Yeah, it was in the banks Okay, okay Yeah. yeah. How did you fall into the service accommodation Airbnb property business? Yeah, so um, my friend at that time um, she took a gap year um, mm. from university and um, she was working her part-time job and I was working my full-time job. So I didn't have a lot of time to kind of venture out and do things. Um, however, she did. Uh, she took her gap year for university. Um, and she was going, a lot on, she was going on, on a lot of viewings um, for, you know, to make it into a service accommodation property. Um, and I think when she got her first key, she FaceTimed me and she was like, you know, um, I've got a property and whatnot. And um, we kind of drifted apart from all of our other friends, but us two, we kind of stayed in touch um, even throughout after leaving school and whatnot, because I think we both were always money orientated. We always kind of, it, it, it's far from the traditional roles that a girl is given to by a culture would kind of family you know um when you're growing up from let's say even if it's an african indian pakistani different kind of these cultures where a woman is just told you know got to be a housewife or just go get a if you, if you go get if you go become a doctor you've made it in life and that's it that's it that's it for you um but for myself and my best friend uh, lena my business partner um that wasn't the goal for us so when we were 16 let's say we started going into we started we tried forex at 16 so we were, i borrowed my mum's money at that at that age when i was 16 to get involved in i think the iml academy I don't know if you know no um but essentially it was more of a pyramid pyramid sorry pyramid uh, kind of scheme where mm. the top's at the top and it's more based on referrals and um how well you're known in in the industries, I think that you don't even have to know how to trade really to make money from that um, from that kind of academy because it was just recruiting people under their name and because people are paying a monthly subscription, they're getting paid and the actual companies getting paid. Um, so whether you knew how to trade or not, 
that wasn't the most important thing at IMRO Academy. It was more about get people under your name. You know, say you're doing trading. Here, I'll, I'll give you a screenshot to post. Say like, yeah. that was your trade. Tell people you can make £100 in literally 10 minutes. Get people under your belt and make residual, residual income from that. And it didn't make sense to me. Um, it kind of scared me, to be honest. Um, I think literally within the first two weeks, I literally left um, and yeah. asked for my refund because really? I was just, yeah, because I was just like, this isn't it. Um, it doesn't sound right. They're not actually teaching trading. Sounds like a scam. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a scam. They did provide the, the resources. However, most of the people that see they're doing what they're doing aren't. Mm. Um, so it's kind of really hard to tell whether um, these people are actually making money from trading. And but do you think people can actually make money from forex trading? Yeah, like I think people can. Like a normal person can. if they go in? Yeah, I think it can. Of course, it's not my expertise, so I can't really say much on it. Yeah. However, um, it probably does take a few years, uh, a very long time to kind of um, understand that risk and the management side to trading. Um, and it's a lot, a lot of psychological things involved with trading as well, where mm. your, your money can, if, you, if you're not managing it properly, and you're just there for, you know, a quick pump, uh, a quick pump of um, money, you can actually lose things if you're not managing things really well. So it was never something that was really good, really um, something what I wanted to do really. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so she, your friend, rings you. I've got a house. Right, and you and her kind of connected because you were money oriented, yeah. Which then what happened? Like, how did you get into it? Yeah. So after she got the property, um, literally, I think the first day that she got the keys, or literally the second day, I went to see, I went to the, view the property myself. Um, in Coventry. No, it was in Birmingham. Okay. Um, so she took me to view the property, and I checked it out, and of course, um, as it was my friend, um, I felt like you know. I should help her out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I wasn't getting paid for it. I wasn't getting paid for anything, but I wanted to help her, you know. Um, naturally, as a friend, you're going to want your friend to succeed um, and your circle to win as well. So, um, with the Airbnb side of things, she got the property and I was just there always helping out. So after I finished my job at Costco, um, I'd then basically rush over to the property and I'd like maybe ask her to pick me up or she'd wait for me until I finished my job. She'd come pick me up and we'd go together to work on the property. Um, we both didn't know where this was going to go. It was kind of a lot of uncertainty, of course, because we didn't take any education. Um, we didn't kind of take any training on service accommodation. It's just seeing other people do it and then just kind of doing it yourself. Hmm. Um, so it was quite scary. Um, and like I said, we didn't really know what, where it was going to go. But, um, and we didn't even think we were going to get to the place where we are today. Mm. Um, it was just more of a thing where, you know, let's do this once and let's see how it goes. If it does, if it does go well, we'll do it again. Um, and yeah, so it was a lot of hard graft, you know, late nights where we'd go there, we'd, we'd, we'd literally sleep um, on the sofa bed, which was literally a click and clank sofa. Um, and both of, us would just, both of us would just stay there. Uh, we'd literally get some kind of like freezer food um, and put in the oven and just have a bit of that and get to work again the next morning. Um, it so when was you mean you get to work, what are you on about? You mean like staging the property? Like yeah. giving it up to, as a service to accommodation to that standard? Yes, yeah, so um, you know, painting the property, doing yeah, the yeah, wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that age of, let's say, 19, you don't know how to wallpaper a property. I've never done it myself. I don't know how to paint. I wasn't really good at painting. You know, you, know, you just don't... You don't do these things at that age. Um, growing up, you get your parents to do it or someone else comes and does the painting. Um, but yeah, we got quite hands-on with the property. Um, also, when you said, when you, when you asked um, what was it that you were doing, what was the graft, it was, yeah, um, staging the property. So doing the flat, uh, flat packs, yeah, yeah. Um, the building the beds, cleaning, a lot of cleaning. Um, yeah, so it was a lot of work, but... We did it, and um, the the property went live within probably let's say a month. Mm. Um, that's way too long. Now, when you think about it, it's, it's way too long to keep a property. Sorry, I think it was actually in two weeks. But now that you think about it, it's it's um, you shouldn't wait two weeks to see the property. You should be doing it within a few days, maximum a week, um, because then you're just burning burning money every single day. The property is not uh, staged and ready for people to book. 
So that's how it started off. Um, January was, was a bit slow. Um, it was, again, a lot of uncertainty. People would book, people wouldn't book. And we didn't really know what we were doing. We were just all kind of experimenting. And when you're experimenting, you do make some kind of expensive mistakes. Um, but it's all paid off, I guess, now. Um, we've kind of, you know, we're at 14 properties, taking on um, a few more as well this month and hopefully on the road to 50 this, this year. Yeah, yeah. So I was coming on. So you have 14 Airbnb properties in Birmingham, in Midlands area or whereabouts? Yes, we have it in the Midlands. So we started off um, in Birmingham. Yeah. And then we've moved it to Coventry now. Um, naturally, the kind of city that you grow up in, you're probably going to think there's not much of a market um, in that kind of city. But, you know, after we did our research, we started seeing like, houses that we'd walk past to go to school, those houses were Airbnbs and you would never have thought that, you know, they're yeah, doing yeah. service accommodation and that kind of opened our eyes into thinking, wait, if they're doing it, we can do it. This we is our it. city, let's dominate it. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. Wow, okay. So, like, your mainly, your majority of your properties that you're put, you put on Airbnb, what are the houses or apartments? Yeah, so um, we've got a mixture, so... There are apartments and there's houses too. Okay. Yeah. Um, with apartments, it is a bit difficult uh, because a lot of the leases, they don't allow service accommodation to like kind of sublet the property. Uh, it goes against the, the head lease. Mm. So um, taking on apartments is harder. You're yeah. better off going and, and going for a house to rent out. Um, yeah, to kind of, it, it's a bit more easier. Okay, okay. So what is the pros and cons to having a house or apartment apart from that? Um, apart from that, literally nothing. Um, the clientele? But, no, not really. Um, I think some people, um, you know, they prefer the house because they have the garden or, you know, they could just walk outside and just smoke a cigarette or something, you know, because we don't allow smoking inside the properties. Um, but in terms of the kind of clientele that we get, they, it doesn't matter whether it's an apartment or it's a house. It's, it's more about the space um, for the clientele, really, and how much space and how, the comfort as well. Okay. Okay. So, you know, you talked about that you didn't take no education to do Airbnb. What about your friend? Did she take any education? Wow. So, you're no. just self-taught. Yeah, so um, as we were going along, so initially my friend, she put the money in for the first property. Yeah. Um, and what we soon started to realise is I was having a lot of input in, in, inside the business as well. Like, you know, um, furniture and interior decoration, it's all done by me. Um, so she'd kind of be asking me all the time, like, oh, what colour... What, um, what colour chair should I get? Um, what coffee table should I get? Like a lot of questions about interior design and, yeah. and I, I would say I'm quite good at that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I was having a lot of involvement in it. After that property went live, I think it was 2021. Um, yeah. So I had a 20K saved and my friend Lena, she was only working part time at Morrison's. So she was only making around 500 pound a month. So I did have a bit more capital. Um, so we just thought, let's do it together. Um, Let's do it together, really. You know, we both have things that can add value to the business. And if we join and team up, then it can grow really rapidly and really fast. And um, we, we both believe in kind of working to our strengths. So there's no point someone uh, there's no point for someone to do something that they're not really good at because you can either be someone that's really good at something mm. or be average at everything. Um, and my friend Nina, she loves to say that, um, but it's, it's, it's really true. For example, myself, I hate talking to agents. I hate talking to landlords. Uh, I don't like dealing with that kind of stuff. Um, whereas with Lena, she loves it. Uh, she loves talking to landlords and agents. Um, with me, I'm more like, you know, give me the keys. Um, I know what to do now. Let like, me got the, uh, Let me crack on. Let me get this property ready for the guests. You know, making sure that it's, because it's a service apartment, it's not just you're putting a bed in, you're putting a TV in. It's not a hotel room. You've got to put it with, you know, you've got to get the cutlery in, the plates. Um, it's the details. Everything. Stuff, yeah, you've got to make sure that it's basically a livable property. You know, if someone's coming from their own house and they're coming to stay at your property for, let's say, a month or, yeah, yeah. or two, it, it's fully equipped to, uh, to live in straight off the bat. So when was this? What year did you get your first one? 220? Um, the first one was 2020, around November, December. Went live 
in uh, New on New Year's Eve, and then 2021, me and my business partner uh, were like, let's do it together, and uh, that's when we just basically cracked on. Um, so where did you find your yeah. properties? Um, we find them on open rent. So we okay. started off with open rent, um, right move. So we started off with landlords, um, talking to landlords dire uh, directly. Um, and of course, it hasn't been easy. It's not just as simple as just going on open rent and you get the first property, you know, reach out to a landlord, first inquiry you put out, you're going to get a yes. We'd go on viewings um, with, with landlords and a lot of the landlords kind of doubted us a lot. So there was this one um, landlord from London, a man, um, and we came for a viewing. Um, this one was, I think, a full bed house in yeah, Birmingham. Yeah. And um, went for the viewing and he just didn't seem really bothered in, in showing us around or anything. Um, and he did let us know that there was another man that came um, who was doing service accommodation as well. And he was, after we left the viewing, we were kind of chasing, chasing him up a little bit on what the, um, what the situation was. And he was basically saying like, oh, another guy's interested and I think I'm gonna go with him because he just looks more experienced. Right. Um, he's, you know, 30, 40, years old, he's been doing it for a very long time. And it kind of really was gutting because it's like, you're not letting us even not giving take us a no chance, opportunity, an it? opportunity. But then of course I can understand that a landlord might want to go with someone that's more experienced, but we, know, we knew for a fact that we would be able to outperform what anyone else was doing um, in the service accommodation industry. Um, but yeah, that was, um, that was a no for that, for that four bed house. Um, and literally within a week, we got a property on the same on the same road, um, literally two doors away, um, and it was a three bed house. Um, the rental price was literally the same, and we negotiated the rent. It was um, the four bed and the three bed was one point eight, and we negotiated it down to one point five. Um, so, in all honesty, the the floor plan and everything, the size of the house, and everything, it was all the same. Um, it was just that the top bedroom was basically the size of a the size of two bedrooms. So mm -hmm. what we did at the top bedroom is we kind of made like a Love Island kind of vibe um, layout where like there's like single beds right next to each other. Well, of course the table, the side tables and everything and the lamps and stuff. Um, but we have like literally four beds mm -hmm. in line with each other. And it's a really big room. So it's, it's, an, it's, not, even, it's not even like it's cramped. It's not cramped. Um, but yeah, um, that property appeals a lot to contractors, a lot to families that are coming to stay, um, working professionals as well, because of the amount of beds that are in that property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, that, and that it fits. Okay, interesting. So you eventually got your first, second property then? Second. So right now you've got 14. So has the journey been, did it start getting easier for you or was there still like a challenge up, up to a certain point? Or is it still a challenge? After the literally the second or third property, I think it was the third one actually. Yeah. Um, we were getting the third one ready in stage. So this third property, it was from the same private agent as the three bedroom, three bedroom house. As she showed us this property, it was really run down. Mm. Um, it's in it's in a council estate. I don't think it's it's council houses anymore, um, but it used to be. Um, and that property was really, really run down. It was really greasy, um, needed a lot of work doing. So we told the landlord, um, we're willing to take the property on, consider, considering only that they're gonna put the investment funds into the property to get to the standards. So we, they initially wanted to put, I think around 5,000 pounds into the property to do the refurb. Um, again, we was only like, I think I just turned 20 at that age um, and refurbing my property was literally sounded crazy uh, mm. to me and Nina. Um, but I think we took the challenge up um, and um, so literally we needed to get this property ready. I think it was uh, within a month um, in terms of the building works and also the furnishing. So we told the landlord um, that Five thousand pounds would not be enough. Enough. Um, so infl inflation was just kicking off around that time. Pro uh, the materials, labour, everything started increasing. Um, so we asked the landlord to give us a budget of ten thousand um, pounds. And the landlord, after a lot of negotiation, you know, we, we had to of course let them know, like, we're not going to take the property on. We're basically doing a full refurb for you. We're basically being a project. We're we're a project. We're acting as a project manager. And they're all the way in Hong Kong. So they were based in Hong Kong. 
the private agent was based in Birmingham. And because the agent had built a good relationship with us and seen that it works out with the previous landlord, uh, they kind of trusted us, trusted us with this uh, third property. So um, we, do, we let the landlord know, of course, that we wouldn't be taken on unless the refurb works were covered by them by themselves. So what that entailed was we knocked down a wall in the in, inside of um, the kitchen. So it kind of made it a bit more of an open plan. Open plan, yeah. Um, we changed the floorings um, to um, laminate. We'd had some lino. We had some carpet. Uh, changed the doors inside. Did it, did fresh paint. Um, new new toilet as well, so we took off the tiles, which was really in bad condition, with some cladding on it, um, new bathtub, new sink, new toilet, literally everything was uh, pretty much brand new. Mm. Um, and we just covered the furniture side of things. Um, but with that builder again, um, a mistake that we learned, um, it's an expensive mistake that we learned from, is never pay a builder upfront, even if it is half the payment that they're asking for, never do that, um, especially if you haven't worked, worked with them before. Um, and we learned that the hard way because literally we agreed um, that we'd give, the, we'd give the remaining funds to the um, builder after he had completed half the works and two weeks had gone by. He was, requested, he was requesting funds actually one week into the work mm. and most, most of the work hadn't even started. It was just ripping out, started. So um, he was started, starting to ask for more money now. I'm just like, what, what do you mean? The landlord is not giving us the money. He has, um, because the landlord was giving it in um, installments. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like, what, are you, what is this money gone to? How, are you, how have you run out? Um, and then he just came with a, a lot of excuses um, until we started taking bookings for this property because we thought that it'd be live. Um, mm. We expected it to be live at a certain date. And it wasn't live because the builder had literally left us on the last week yeah, um, yeah. of of the works because he'd he'd been paid around seven point five k, and I think the remaining two point five k we had, um, and we were only going to pay him until the works were finished. But he had le left, and he only, he made an excuse that his van was broken down. I mean, you know, as a builder, if you've taken a job on, you need to you know finish that work off. Even if your van is broken down, you're going to find a replacement. But for him, he was making hours if it was the end of the world and he wouldn't be able to continue. So within literally uh, three days um, of us finding out, I think two to three days, we've got another builder in. Um, and you know, when you're working in the property industry as yourself, you work in the property industry yourself, um, you probably know that getting a builder in such last minute where, you know, first we were, first we got a builder in within the first week and then the second builder that we had finishing the works off, we literally got within a few days. Um, it's very hard to find builders so last minute um, that do a good job, that aren't going to charge you crazy prices. But we were able to get the property done the day that the guests were checking in. So the guests actually checked in um, two hours early and this was around the Commonwealth Games. So Commonwealth Games, people were paying crazy amounts uh, for literally one week, paying around £2,000, two weeks around two to £3,000 uh, to stay at your Airbnb property. Um, and the actual guest came into the property while the works were going on. So while the builder hadn't even um, joined the lino to the carpet, you know, where you have that little strip. Um, Skirting board. It was like metal, what do you call it? All right, okay, that, that holds it together. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, where the kind of two yeah, yeah, materials yeah, yeah. they meet, you put that little uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. metal bit, right? He had the, you know, these little things, they were missing, and they came in, the builder's stuff is all lying around, um, and there were some wires that hadn't been boxed off yet. Um, it still smelled like paint. And the whole house was a tip. And um, <laughs> it was really, really embarrassing to the point that um, the lady was actually in tears. So that was something that we learned from, a mistake that we learned from again during the journey to our third property. Um, what lessons course, did you learn there? Um, don't put the property don't up. Don't <laughs> put the property. If the refurb works needed, it required someone else to take part mm. into it. Don't list the property. Don't get uh, you know your hopes up so soon that it's getting ready the exact yeah, date yeah, that yeah. you want it to be. Because with builders, even if you give them a date, uh, an end date, they're going to take it literally 100%. a week, a week later um, or a few weeks later. Put some extra time on it, basically. Yeah. So put a few extra, yeah, bit, put a bit of an extra time on it. Um, if we're doing it ourselves and we give ourselves a deadline, we get it done. Um, that's not a problem. But when you're relying on a builder to do these kind of works, and of course the works were quite a bit. Um, 
a big refurb needed. So um, listing the property, it was a mis mistake that we made. I think we had to refund the guests literally um, half the payment that they made. So we didn't make a huge amount of profit, um, but they stayed and, you know, after they, get, they got their half the money back, they were all happy. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's kind of, it's a bit like, I understand they had a bad experience, but after we refund the money, maybe it was the money aspect because they paid, they paid quite a bit. So maybe they just wanted their money's worth and they were kind of shocked when they came in. And it's just a bit of a um, gesture that we had to do just yeah, to get things Yeah, goodwill gesture, resolved. right? You had yeah. to do that, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of lessons you must have learned there though, right? Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but I think that was, out of all our properties that we've taken on, we haven't had... Um, a big refurb like mm. that one that we had in, in, on the third one and it was again a big learning curve that mm -hmm, we had mm -hmm. crazy then then what happened that was your third property right mm. so how have you scaled so fast then yeah so um i think that property that we took on was around like april um 2021 yeah yeah 2021 or 2022. I'm, I'm actually getting start i'm getting signs again got so up. many now <laughs> yeah so <clears throat> that one was I think it was last year, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, but has your journey got easier or has it got like... No, it hasn't gone easier. Um, and I'll explain why. So um, so after that third property, um, yeah. we were we were literally taking on uh, four properties in within the same month um, at, at, at one go uh, because the demand um, that we had for these properties were crazy. You know, we started seeing uh, an incredible amount of demand where students were coming in um, during September and they wanted a book in advance and yeah, they, yeah. they were paying some good money. They were staying long term. So our market with Airbnb, a lot of people think that Airbnb is like a one night, two night thing. It's not we attract guests that stay for months um, and that's our kind of our, our niche uh, yeah 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 so people were paying a lot of money in advance and we were like they were sending out a lot of inquiries and we were just basically saying um we haven't got a property yet for you but we can source one we can furnish one it'll be ready in date um so we basically did that and took four properties on during the summer and it was a lot of, um, again, it was a lot of work. So as you you might think that, you know, you're taking on more properties. I left my job um, and at the, at the second, third one and taking on more properties, you're going to be in a better situation, you know, financially. Although that was the case, kind of, um, mm. at the same time, a lot of work was needed. So we wouldn't be able to like kind of, we didn't have a social life, I'll be honest with you. Um, I can imagine. Yeah, we didn't even have time to meet our like go out with family um, on meals. So my family would go out every weekend on a Sunday or every other weekend on a Sunday to go out to eat, um, just by tradition, um, just to get together and, and and you know sit together and eat together. Um, I'd have to miss out on a lot of family meals, um, and, and uh, along the journey as well, my mum was basically really like saying to me, "Oh, you've got three now. Why do you need more?" Um, you know stop you know take a step back you don't want to get yourself um too ahead of yourself you don't want to get ahead of yourself sorry um and you don't want you know it's risky you're taking on a lot of properties what's going to happen um but yeah we're taking on a lot of properties and it, it has it hasn't been easy only because with more guests it comes more customer service you know you're not um making we're not sitting down making money from my laptop trading or making money through um selling products on Amazon or um, I don't know basically it's not, it's not a digital kind of yeah, business yeah. Um, of course it is online yes however you're dealing with actual customers um, and customer service needs to be there so that's where we started looking at how can we systemize this business a lot of people talk about how to get into Airbnb how to find your property how to set up your company um, and once you've got your property there you're done now you're sorted but no one talks about the aftermath of, of um, what to do you after you have the property after you have the property sorry mm. Um, and how to keep it going so that you're not just staying stuck and, and you're not just um, at a standpoint with free properties. You know, you can grow it and scale it to 10, 20, 30. Um, so that's the kind of most important thing that um, was challenging for us and the most important thing that we've learned um, during our journey, which is systemizing as you, as you go along. So, How did you learn that though? Where did you learn that? Um, 
again, we didn't really learn it from anyone. Just research, just checking things? Re research, um, but also being within the kind of property industry, networking and stuff That's like that. Say, yeah. yeah, so networking, um, we'd go on kind of viewings and sometimes, you know, um, someone in the service accommodation industry, industry we could probably contact them and, and, and be like, oh, well, who's your cleaners? Oh, um, what software do you use for this? It's just basically using... Figuring stuff out, basically. Yeah, figuring stuff out and using the resources that you have available to you mm. um, to help you to and, and to help you get to where you want to be. Um, but again, it wasn't education as such, from paying for education, um, only because there's a lot of people out there in the Airbnb space that say, and then and they teach, how to do Airbnb, but there's not many people that actually do it. So we know there's a lot of people in the Airbnb game that teach people how to do it. But when I ask them, how many properties have you got? They, 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 have, they haven't got any. They're just teaching it yeah. as, as a way They're to They're the make. worst sort of educators. Then. Yeah, so we kind of ne never really trust anyone to teach us that kind of side to it. We just had to go and learn it all ourselves. Mm. Um, and yeah, systemizing. So for example, we have, um, we have VAs, people who, you know, handle the guest communication side of things. So we're not on the phone 24 seven, you know, having to deal with um, customer service because it's all about doing income generating tasks. So instead of, you know, spending hours on, a, on, on the phone every single day, draining yourself and draining your energy, talking to guests and dealing with complaints and dealing with refunds or dealing with um, many, different, many different things, you know, um, instead of doing those kind of things, we, pay someone to do that side and then we are taking on more properties and more deals which is making us far more than what what it would make us um what we have to pay sorry someone else to do the other work for us yeah so let so, me just stop you there i've got yeah. a question for you so when you say that you've systemized in terms of vas are dealing with customer service side of things how are you advertising your your properties is it on right move and, and not right move is it just on airbnb and booking.com? Yes, yeah, so we advertise it on many different platforms like Airbnb and booking.com. We have a few others as well that we um, that we post our properties on. But even things like open rent, you know, yeah. anyone can post on open rent. And um, instead of landlords being on there, a lot of people, from, a lot of people from, sorry, it's getting a bit much. <laughs> a lot of people from the Airbnb space yeah. also post on open rent um, and you can literally post your property for £3,000 per month. Um, so you're covering your rent, which is let's say £1,000. You're covering your bills, which is let's say £400. And then you're making the extra the extra profit. You know, We aim to get around £800 to £1,000 profit per month. Yeah, yeah. Um, so of course we, you know we do tend to get more in during the summer t summer months um but on average when we're doing our research we want to make sure that we're guaranteed at least 800 minimum um per property per property yeah but what i'm asking you is that see your vas are they dealing with bookings or because i i from my what i understand is that are the bookings not just done online yeah, Where so, does the phone call, like the speaking, what, what's the reason for that? Yeah, so for example, I guess my, so, you know, check in, check in times and check out times. So um, I guess when I want to check in, so the check in time, sorry, is 4 p.m. Right. Standard time check in is 4 p.m. And a guest might want to be like, hi, how do I check in earlier? Um, and kind of taking them through that how to do that process it's literally, yeah it's it's just very it's very little things even when like a guest is um kind of on phone to you like oh the shower isn't working the it's cold no, water yeah, yeah. the wi-fi isn't working these very little things that can be solved by outsourcing and getting someone else yeah, to yeah, yeah, do these tasks um that's the most important thing you know the amount that you're paying someone to do these tasks is very little to what you're making by taking more properties on so it's literally like it's just a stress about, you don't need isn't it yeah. Just, yeah 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 no i fully get it which is really good because I, I believe that everyone should eventually systemize it right what you can just take off your hands just take them off yeah and most businesses you know it's it's not a business if you're not systemizing no no it's it, not if, if you haven't got the systems in place, it's basically a full-time job. We, would, we wouldn't be able to enjoy what this business has allowed us um, 
to do in life, the kind of freedom that it's given us in terms of location freedom, uh, time freedom, uh, financial freedom, etc. All these kind of luxuries in life that people want. There's no point of trying to create something and create a business for yourself if you're not systemizing it because you're just stuck at home on the phone and, and having all these negative experiences when, you know, if you've systemized everything, um, you can avoid all that and, and live, a, live a better life, live a better quality of life. And as well, um, most businesses, um, they're only worth a lot if you've had the systems in place. So eventually you can sell businesses on um, if you've got the systems running so smoothly and um, someone might want to buy it from you within the next few years so um, it's always about making the operations and the systems uh, kind of run smooth so even if I was sleeping in bed literally I wake up sometimes 10 a.m 11 a.m today I woke up out of bed at let's say 11 to 12 because I was ill um, I'm, I'm currently ill but um, I was only able to do that because I have a VA who's dealing with the guest communications who's um, so for example today a guest wanted to check in they left Park Regis Hotel in Birmingham at 11 a.m and they wanted to check into to, to the next property um, but our our time for check-in is 4 p.m so they were like you know complaining like oh my god I never knew um, this is a horrible experience you know with guests they're quite demanding they're paying for a service and they mm. just want the best um, so it's just kind of you know um, give them that guest satisfaction um, so they book again with you. They don't want you don't want to give a guest a bad uh, experience, and they'll never return because we do get guests that want to stay with us again and again because of that uh, communication that we have with them. You know, we're very quick with replies if they ever need anything, and uh, that's the most important thing in you know running a service accommodation and being in the space of Airbnb. Mm -hmm, definitely, no, no, I fully agree with you. So at the moment, how many? Uh, what what's your target then? What do you want to, where do you want to get to? You've already got 14. So you want to get to, did you say number 50 you want to get to? Yeah. By this year? Yeah, by this year. So um, we want to get to a point where um, we've scaled the rent to rent business, but also we're looking into buying properties this year. Okay. So um, it's all fun, you know, having that kind of quick cash coming in per month. Airbnb, it's more of a monthly cash flow kind of business. So yeah. So, you know, there's two types of businesses, really. Um, I mention it all the time, um, slow cash and quick cash. Um, with Airbnb, it's quick cash. Um, you're able to make a lot more than what your normal monthly income might be working a nine to five job. So um, with that, you're basically making money from other people's assets, assets that you don't own. Yeah. You want to get to a position where and then the ultimate goal was always to own assets, you know. Like I mentioned to you, at 20, when I had £20,000, so I think when I, when I, at the end of 19, 20, I don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Around, I forgot the age exactly, but um, at the end of that age, um, I had 20K and I was just like, oh no, I, I want to buy a property. But it kicks in that you can't because you're still working a 9 to 5 job. But now that um, I'm not working a job and I have that nice monthly income coming in, that cash flow coming in, I can now invest that comfortably into a more kind of uh, slower return um, investing in properties um, buying buying your own assets because that is something that no one can take away from you um, and you know you don't have anyone on, you know on top of you whereas with rent to rent service accommodation you have landlords who can potentially take the property off you um, of course the chances are slim if um, they're paying the rent on time. We pay our landlords rent early because with the business, um, the money comes in quite fast and you're just able to pay them and keep them happy, really, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and not deal with situations where the landlord is having to chase up on rent. So we never have a landlord chasing up on the rent. We have direct debit set up and they go out um, on the day that it's supposed to be um, set. And, um, yeah, really... To do it with our own assets is the ultimate goal because you get the capital appreciation side of things. Um, and there's one thing being rich, but being wealthy is, is another another thing. So that's the kind of thing that we want to focus on now, um, building wealth, generational wealth. Really good, really, really good. And also, once you buy your own property, really, if you wanted to put it on Airbnb, you can do that as well if you really wanted to, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Your own, it's your own property, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so that's what we're looking to do. So um, I'm looking to potentially have two two properties in my own name to buy them this year um, and turn them into service accommodations potentially or even just normal buy to let so let you know get an agent to manage it 
Um, so this is something that I actually did invest in a mentor to teach me because um, with the kind of experience I've had with rent to rent, Airbnb, service accommodation, we've learned that paying someone um, is very important to, you know, paying someone to teach you something to avoid those heavy, expensive mistakes. Of course it is. It, it saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of money. It gets you to where you want to be much faster, you know. It kind of accelerates your performance um, really quick. So, yeah, we paid a mentor to teach us how to buy properties, you know, run down properties, add value, pull that money out. So this is something that I'm doing this year. Um, and yeah, I, I do really advocate for seeking out education um, because even at the place where I'm now, um, yeah. only a mentor can take you from, let's say, £10,000 to £100,000 per month and £100,000 per month to a million per month. Um, people that are actually making that money, yeah. they're the ones that you should be relying on. Not relying on, sorry, but kind of reaching Looking out. Looking for inspiration help. from, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. And I think, like, success, that's the best cheat code to success, really, getting yeah. a mentor. Yeah, there's no point reinventing the wheel because it's, it's already made. So, for example, this Airbnb business, yeah. um, you know, it's a, it's a game that people have been doing for years. You know, a lot of people think that it's something very new, but it's not. A lot of, you know, the older generation uh, kind of people, um, like, for example, holiday lets and cottages and stuff, before Airbnb, of course, Airbnb didn't exist. They were probably putting on their own websites per yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, after the whole Airbnb kind of craze and... Um, after that, a lot of people were trying to get in um, recently, in the, next, in the last few years. Um, but this kind of thing, a lot of people have been doing it for many years before us. Um, so, yeah, again, it's not about reinventing the wheel. Um, it's just people, are, it's a system that's already been made. Just follow it step by step. Of course it is. Can I ask you who you got educated from for the, for the BRR stuff? The educator name, um, his, his name is Harvey, so he has really helped us um, in terms of social media side of things. So when we started posting about Airbnb on social media yeah. and on TikTok, we were getting a lot of people, you know, asking us a lot of questions like, oh, uh, how do you get into Airbnb? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, when it first started off um, on social media, I never really wanted to put it out there in a sense where... I'm teaching people how to do it, yeah, yeah. Um, but with Harvey, he does property investing, but also he teaches other people as well, and, and he and he openly talks about property investing, and he was really he was really a kind of um, in pushing pushing us, me and, and business partner Lena, uh, pushing me to take my social media game to the next level. So yeah. um, he has just helped me in the aspect of learning how to buy properties, but he's also out helping us in the aspect of um, putting myself out there and filling in that gap where, you know how I mentioned, there's a lot of people that do Airbnb, uh, that teach how to do Airbnb, yeah, but they yeah. don't actually don't have do Airbnb it? properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so whereas, credit given where credit's due in it, really, because I know so many like educators that really do know a lot of educators. And most of them don't do what they preach. Hmm. They literally don't. I'm, I'm not talking like just properties. I'm talking like in business, in social media, and so many different things. They just don't do what they say. Yeah, and, and he really kind of advocated for us to go ahead and, you know, be open about what we're doing. So there was a point um, where we started taking our videos down because we were thinking, oh, my God, is the Airbnb market going to get so saturated, you know, um, and these things. But then he kind of instilled in our, in our minds that, um, instead of having this kind of mindset, change it to the mindset where, you know, you're thinking more abundantly that um, you could teach other people and they're not kind of taken away from your your pot, really. Um, and that's why we started posting more on social media and we teach people now as well how to do Airbnb. Um, yeah, man, that's good. And you know what? You're in the perfect place to teach people as well because you're actually doing it. You've got 14. Mm. And even if you had two or three, you'd still be in a good place to teach. But where you're 14, like you can definitely teach. So have you got courses or something or? Yeah, so we don't like to say courses um, only because we're not just throwing like a package, like an like education kind of. Is it like personal service that you offer? Yeah, so um, yeah, so we basically have, uh, offer coaching for people mm. um, where um, we provide them the resources, but also we have these calls, we get on with them. Um, 
Yeah, so it's more of a one-to-one -one and they kind of reach out to us whenever they need any help. So we're kind of with them throughout the whole journey. And like I mentioned to you earlier, it's not just about us telling them how to set the company up and get property. It's about you know how to scale it to a six-figure business, like how we have um, within a year. So um, again, all the systems in place, we're teaching them that. So they're not just folks, you know, they're not just sat on two properties. They can, they're able to grow it to 10, 20, 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's really good. So how much, it's okay. So how much money, like how much money do you want revenue coming in every month? Like profit? Like do you have a target in your mind? In your mind? Yeah. Like you, want, you want to earn this much and you'll be like a little bit happy? There's not necessarily a figure where okay. if I hit it, I'll be happy. I don't believe in, you know, when, when you get, only when I have, let's say 50K per month, I'll be happy. I'm, I'm happy right now. I'm yeah. happy with the progress I've made. Um, and, you know, with the income that's being made per month, I'm always going to try to, you know, hit new levels. Um, yeah. For us this year, um, the goal is to hit one million in profit this year. Okay. And I know, it, and I know it, it does blow a lot of people's minds. It's like, how are you going to do that? Um, but we again, um, when we set ourselves a goal, when I set myself a goal, I'm backtracking to see how am I going to be able to hit that goal. So I definitely believe within by the end of this year, or probably the middle of next year. I will have um, hit one million pounds in profit. In net? In net profit. That's really good. That's impressive. What are you going to do then? Buy loads of houses? Um, so, yeah, so I am looking to buy houses that many. I'm also looking to, of course, get my mum um, in, in, in a better position. So, um, financially. So, yeah, I give my mum money per month right now. So, I don't, I don't live... Um, at home anymore. I moved out a few months ago um, because, you know, like I mentioned to you, I grew up in a council house background and as I'm kind of um, going through that journey of self-development and I'm, and I'm hitting new levels, people, people might think, I don't, everyone has a different perspective on it, but I, I felt like I had to remove myself from that environment and put myself somewhere different, a bit more isolated, where I can kind of focus on my goals, my visions, my work, achieving new levels in life. Because um, myself, I was living in a room with three to four other people. Um, so growing up, it was me, my sister, my, and my mum mm. um, in commentary and at that at, in that house. We were sharing one room. Um, and then my mum had my little sister, so then it was four of us in one room. And, you know, we had this uh, bunk bed where it was a double bunk bed, a double mattress on the bottom and there was a single one on top. And then my mum would sleep on the floor. Um, and it's just not nice, you know, um, especially because I'm always working and my work requires me to be on my laptop. It might disturb my sister's, you know, her her privacy where I'm on live calls with people yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and it might disturb you know a few people and also I'm getting disturbed because there's a lot of noise in the house with little children and, and, and things like that um, getting distracted then, isn't it? yeah so to kind of avoid that distraction I, I moved out a few months ago and um, you got your own apartment or yeah so I've got yeah, my yeah. own apartment um, so like I, like I said again um, I'm paying for my own rent and bills, groceries, everything. Um, however, I'm still giving back to my mom, you know, so, th so I'm, I'm contributing to the rent in that property. Um, and inshallah, you know, you know as, as the year goes by, I'll be able to give much more back um, as well. Going, taking my mom to Umrah is one of the goals that I want to, I want to do. And a lot of people think that, um, what are you gonna do with all this money? You know, why do you need this money? And, a lot of people think, forget that to be able to to be able to even do the most simple things in life, or be able to uh, go on these religious um, pilgrimages and stuff like that, it does require a lot of money. You know, the average person um, saves literally their entire life um, un until they're literally in their forties and fifties to go. Yeah, but I, my mum was never in that financial position to go to Umrah, like. Her brothers and you know them, they they they're from Africa and they own businesses. Um, however, um, my mum kind of you know got married to the wrong man, um, made a few mistakes in life. She's in she's in the UK, um, and although my family is back in Africa, they're still making more than than you know what 
our family was making. And of course, now my, situa my situation has changed, so um, I'm in a better position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but definitely by the end of the year, you know, um, you want to take getting my mum out of that house and and taking us Umrah and and buying a few properties in my name. Um, also, you know, getting getting the car that I want and um, just growing out of the kind of barriers and limitations that I was given growing up and um, changing my surroundings because when you change your surroundings that's when you kind of have the most growth because um, certain experiences will want you to never go back to certain living conditions so for example um, you know now that I've moved out of my own apartment I would never go back to living as bad, I don't know if it sounds bad, but I would never go back to living in my mum's council house. Um, mm. And my goal now is to get her out of it because, you know, just like a few months ago before I moved out, I still thought that it was a, li a, a normal environment, kind of, semi. Of course, I didn't think it was 100% the right place to be because I was always wanting to more for myself. But um, you kind of can live with it. But now it's like I've gotten to a point where I can't live with being in in a, in a in a room where I'm I'm stuck with four other people, it's mm. something that I cannot do at all. So um, again, um, me and me and my, me and my friend went to Dubai um, a month ago and a month or two ago in January, and we took a business uh, business class flight. Um, it did cost a lot, um, and growing up, you probably think in your head like, oh my How god. Was it cost? Um, so we actually paid for it. It was a last minute decision. So we paid for it when we got there. So you need think, to get out of these last minute things. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am a last minute person, but um, I think it costs around five hundred pound each for us on top of what we originally paid. So right. nearly hitting, let's say, a grand for one ticket. Mm. Um, it's not a lot, but you can get cheaper tickets. Um, I know some people they pay, you know, five k. 10k for you know some kind of some flights um you know depending if it's a, a business sorry a first class flight and stuff like that um so yeah i wouldn't say it's a crazy amount to spend on a flight you know people people do spend, spend a lot more um however to experience that i never want to go back to economy because um not in a snobby way but you know the service that you're getting, the amount of leg room that you have. Um, of course it is. It's nothing wrong with having good taste. Yeah. So, you know, and also when, when you're in business class and you have that bit more space, you can do work on your laptop. When you're running a business, you know, you sometimes don't get a, a, a break. As some people it might be sitting in an economy watching a movie, but you see if you go into business class, they're probably doing some other things. Um, so, yeah, it's all about mindset shifts, being exposed to new experiences in life. Yeah. which kind of opens new doors for you and uh, makes you never want to go back to living in a certain way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do you have friends that support you or do they not understand what you're doing? Or have you just got totally like new set of friends or, or have you not got friends? Have you just got your business partner? Like what's your situation at the moment? Hey YouTube, I'm really sorry to cut you off, but I have to share this with you. I want you to get to your next level, and I believe that personal development is the gateway to success. So what I've done is I've gone and created a seven day free audio course. This is totally free. All you have to do is sign up, and from day one till day seven, every single day, you will receive a two minute audio from me, which will elevate your mindset and give you power in your business. Make sure you go and sign up and let me know how you find it. Yeah, so um, a few of my friends might watch this. <laughs> so I've got to be careful with what I'm saying. Um, Just be truthful. <laughs> so, um, of course, I have my best friend, which is my business partner. Yeah. Um, and we're on, the same, we're on the same wavelength. Yeah. So um, we're always discussing, you know, we discuss everything from personal to business. We do talk about everything. Um, and apart from that, I would say... I don't want to get this wrong, but I don't have any other friends apart from one person um, who I grew up with uh, since I was in year one. So same primary school. Um, her brother was friends with my brother, and we, you know, she used to have sleepovers with me at my house, and we kind of known each other all our lives. So um, when I was going through a lot of hardships, um, where my mum would kind of like get angry at me when I was not giving her money when I was working at Costco, I'd kind of like have to leave my house for a few nights because it'd, it'd end up in really big arguments. Um, so I'd go to my friend's house to stay and she's been there with me through a lot of the things um, when I was at my lowest points. Um, and also 
when I didn't have a job, she was helping me kind of create my CV and help, like, supporting me. Like, even when we go out, go out for meals, she'd pay for my meal here and there. So um, her name is Smea. So if you're watching Smea, <laughs> um, thank you. But, um, yeah, yeah. You can't so, forget people like that, innit? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. apart from Lena and Smea, in terms of friends, I don't have any. Um, my sister-in-law I'd count as a friend as well. So she's my sister-in-law, but she's uh, like one or two years older than me. Um, I count her as a friend. So I don't have many other people um, apart from that in my life, only because they don't understand the journey. A lot of people envy as well. A lot of people, um, they just don't have the same kind of mindset. It. Yeah, they don't get it. So it's pretty, it's, it's absolutely normal that, so, yeah, so it's a, normal. As you kind of increase, um, as you go up the levels in life, um, I think it's very important to cut out all the kind of extra noise that you don't need. So even people that I knew back in secondary school, I've literally unfollowed all of them. Um, I don't even use Snapchat because Snapchat was mostly for people that, you know, in secondary school, you kind of try to keep in touch with what they're doing every single day. I don't feel the need to post on Snapchat. Um, I'm just really business orientated. I post my day, day in the life, kind of what I do every single day on my Instagram. And I am more interested in connecting with high value individuals. Um, you know, I give a lot of value out there on my social media. And from there, um, I'm, I'm inevitably going to attract high value individuals. For example, yourself, like, you know, a normal secondary school girl who's got those kind of cultures and values and a lot of the families are kind of telling them what to do in life, go to university, be quiet, stay at home, be a, you know, cook and clean. They would never come and sit with a random man, you know, on a podcast yeah, and yeah, talk yeah. with them. But only certain people will um, and share the experiences. And, no, you know, I would never have met you if, um, you know, I wasn't posting on social media, you weren't posting on social media and... Um, it's all about connecting with high value people really. That's, that's it, that's correct, yeah. So what advice would you give to a 20, 21 year old who's just partying every weekend and then complaining that why her life is not, or his life is not good? Yeah, so I believe they're the worst type of people in my opinion. <laughs> um, if you're 20, 21 and you're partying away and then you, you know by the end of the week you're complaining that you have no money, like it's very off-putting in my in my opinion. Um, I would definitely recommend to sort their life out. And a lot of people, if they don't have the mindset, yeah. they're not going to they're not going to change what they're doing because um, they're choosing temporary pleasure over a more long-term, you know, long-term plan for themselves. Um, they're thinking, you know, I'm in my twenties. Let me enjoy my twenties. When I'm thirties, I'll, I'll, I'll have a lot of time to think about it. But in reality, you should be setting up you know, in your 20s, you should be setting yourself up for your 30s, um, especially if, you know, you're working a nine-to-five job. You know, I, when I was working in my nine-to-five job, I'd get a lot of people complain, like, oh, I only have £10 left for the rest of the week. Oh, um, and, and a lot of these people, they really live low-quality, low-quality lives, in my mm. opinion. Um, they're eating noodles every day. No, no hate to anyone that's eating, eating noodles, by the way, but, um, you know... What you put in yourself and how you treat yourself is very important. Um, yeah. You know, for you to perform your best, you've got you got to eat good. You've got to exercise. You've got to take care of yourself. The way you look, the way you present yourself, and the way you carry yourself is very important. Most people that um, party and 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 kind of um, don't care about where they're heading in the next few years. Most of the most of the time, these kind of people they kind of lack. Confidence, self-esteem. They don't have any kind of direction, and they don't have lots of. They don't have any goals. Um, they're living in a fantasy kind of world. Um, and my advice to those kind of people would be: um, it depends on how much they want it. Um, if you really want a successful life for yourself, figure out what you want to do. You don't have to go into Airbnb. You know, you don't have to do the what. You don't have to kind of do what I've done. But in this kind of generation, in, in, in 2023, there's so many opportunities out there for you. To, and as cliche as it sounds, a lot of people say it as well, the internet has provided so many opportunities to people. You know, making money in this day and age is so easy um, compared to what it was like, you know, in the, in the 1900s and stuff. So I definitely use that um, to your advantage. A lot of people think that, you know, um, a lot of people are quick to complain about the situation, but then, you know, they're not questioning the actions they're taking every single 
weekend, you know, they're getting drunk. Monday morning comes and they're still, um, what would you call it? Hungover. Hungover, yeah. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. Have you read any books? If so, which ones? Or you don't really read any books? So I've got a lot of books sitting at home, but... Um, Not yet. I've got a lot of books, but I don't read them because I don't have the time. Again, you can't argue that I do have the time because if I wanted to... Um, at least you've got them, possibly... that's the first step, right? Yeah, um, so I've got, I do have a lot of books, but what I do prefer is listening to podcasts. You know, I love listening to Alex Hormozzi, a lot of other people. Um, so in, instead of me reading books, which is very, which is again, very important, I can be watching podcasts while I'm eating my meal. Because you um, learn from there as well, right? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, either way you're still learning. Even on my social media, um, the kind of people that I follow, I'm, I'm not taking in kind of bad content that's yeah, yeah, messing yeah. with my all positive stuff all positive stuff and not just positive positive it's one thing being positive and motivational but um something that's educational and giving you that kind of uh pushing you to kind of shift what you're doing in life um yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of those kind of things as well so talking about gym and health do you actually go gym and look after yourself yeah so um at the moment, I'm not currently going uh, like consistently and regularly. Yeah. Um, only because with the Airbnb side of things, I think the first year with with um, you know running your Airbnb business, um, I wasn't really looking after myself, and neither was my business partner. I think um, when you're growing a business, sometimes you kind of let yourself go a little bit, only because there's a lot of things going on, and you know. Uh, running a business, it's not easy. You know, I I basically wake up in the morning and um, Keep in mind, I love taking care of myself the way I present myself and stuff. But there was a time last year where, like, I wouldn't even care, like, uh, how I did my hair and, and stuff. I just basically run out in a, a tracksuit and just uh, basically just get to work and get to grafting. Because with property, um, it's very hands-on. Um, well, it used to be until we've kind of now started to outsource uh, yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Now we get people in to do the setting up for us, to do the flat packs for us. But let's say last year... Um, it was very hard to kind of give myself that time because I was really engrossed in business. Whereas now this year, um, I am looking into, of course, I'm looking into gym memberships. So I've had a look at David Lloyd's, I've had a look at um, a, a, a few others. It's 24 hours now, you can go anywhere really. Yeah, so um, I'm just trying to find that a, a nice gym for myself so I can actually uh, feel that kind of comfort in working out. Um, I worked out in Dubai, I think it was Paramount Hotel, and the gym was absolutely beautiful. You have the skyline, the Dubai skyline view when you're working out. As the as the sun was rising, you get to see you know the world basically wake up, and it was beautiful. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Def definitely um, going back to gym this year, definitely. Okay, I'll hold you to that. I'll check up on you. That's fine. Three months. <laughs> Um, okay, so are you going to Dubai soon? Yeah, um, going to Dubai. Do you have plans eventually to move there? Yeah. At the moment, we are looking to open up businesses um, in Dubai. Yeah. Don't want to give too much away um, because, you know, it's still in, 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 in the process of things. You mean actual, when you say businesses, you mean just setups or do you mean like actual like properties up there for Airbnb? That's one of the plans. One okay, of them. eventually. Yeah. Um, A lot of so chairs in Dubai. Yeah, so that's the reason why um, we went back in January, networked with a few people, and we're going back again um, next week. To figure stuff out. To finish a few pending pending things, I'd say. Okay, okay. Well, I wish you all the best with that. Thank you. Are you in a relationship? <laughs> no. So you're <laughs> no. single? Yeah. Are you looking for a relationship, or is that not even in your on your radar? Um, or no. Or are you one of them, like... If it happens, it happens. Right, so... Okay. Um, I like with, how you like, let me think how I should answer. Yeah, I've got to think how I'm going to word it. Yeah. So, I think you had a podcast of Zayma and she kind of mentioned this as well. Um, I asked Zayma another question. She got herself in all sorts of trouble. <laughs> a lot of people mm. um, that might be messaging me in the DMs or stuff like okay. that, yeah, yeah. they're not very high value people <laughs> yeah. um don't message not, it then <laughs> yeah so they're not very high valued men i'd say um and a lot of the time i'm doing better than them um, yeah, yeah. and ultimately in a relationship dynamic that might kind of cause issues in my opinion yeah. um you know dominance kind of issues where yeah you'll I, just you'll just basically in every situ in every department you're doing better than them 
So it's yeah, hard. so it's really I, difficult, isn't it? I think she mentioned that she wouldn't go with for anyone that would work a nine to five. And again, yeah, I, yeah. I wouldn't either. Um, only because I I started this business to mm. never have those nine to five restrictions or live that kind of um, the rat race. Whereas if my partner is living the rat race and they haven't figured things out, um, then I really question their mindset. I really yeah, question. Yeah what's going on in their life and why they haven't taken any action um because of course i am where i am now i'm not going to settle for less really um yeah. and also i'm in the point where i'm growing my business so it's not something that i'm looking so much into um if it happens it happens but i'm not actively going out to look for anything um it's not like the biggest priority yeah, yeah. for me right now yeah got it okay so final question what is the biggest adversity that you've faced that stands out for you right now, like up until now? It could be personal, it could be at home, it could be business. You just thought, flipping hell, I'm so glad that that's behind me. I think it would honestly be the fact that um, the kind of environment that I grew up in, in the council house, and I've, and I've able to, you know, I've, I've been able to move out and take my life into my own hands into my own control mm. a lot of people find it very difficult to do that you know to become self-employed and and um rely and be confident that their business is going to provide for them a lot of people are very scared to leave their nine to five but i was never one of them um people to be scared to leave um biggest ad adversity i think it would be that um Probably the growing up. Growing up, yeah. Seeing seen my mum and dad argue as well. You know, he was quite abusive. Um, although, although it doesn't happen anymore, where he's not abusive to her physically anymore, because of course he's out of the picture. Part of me still isn't over it, um, because, you know, I, I, I question him as a man. Yeah. Um, how can you... How can you do that to a woman? How can you treat her so bad? How can you not provide for your children? Because my mom has mostly done everything that um, was needed for her children. Um, my dad, he didn't really put a lot of the work in. So um, that kind of thing, it, it is left in the past. I'm able to now do things for myself and not have to rely on anyone, which has given me a lot of power. Um, and I feel kind of free in that sense. However, forgiving him is something that I, um, probably will always be. Um, yeah, you've not dealt with it yet. Yeah. Yeah, it takes time. It takes time. And Especially when the, when the person hasn't changed, um, and if it's something that you know the kind of person that they still are, um, then yeah, it is definitely hard to forgive. Mm. But that's where you know I want to give my mum a better life because she's always had challenges a lot of difficulties you know she came to the uk um without that passport um sorry without the the right to stay in the uk a british passport my bad uh, she couldn't speak english and a lot of things so um a lot of the hard times are in the past i'd say i'd say that um in different stages of your life your problems don't stop you just get different types of problems. You get you get faced with different types of challenges. So mm. the challenges that I had in the past growing up are not the same challenges that I have today. Yeah. With Also with more money comes more responsibility. So although people are sitting there at home thinking, oh, she has you know everything f on a plate for her, um, that's not the case because, you know, with, with, with more properties comes more guests, more turnover, um, more landlords, thinking more landlords. Um, now I'm teaching people as well, um, and a, a, a lot of different things, right? Um, more money comes more problems. Definitely. So, Definitely. although I've gone past some things in, the, um, in, in when I was growing up, um, younger kind of young years of my life, um, problems don't stop. You just mm. get faced with different types of problems. More power to you for you know for. Just continuing with it. What's your relationship like with your mum? Yeah, so with my mum, we don't see 
eye to eye on a lot of things. So the okay. way she sees things, I don't see things in the same way as her. But of course, I always want the best for her. So financially, um, I'm always going to want to give back to my mum. Um, also because with the challenges that she's faced, with any kind of you know individual human, with a more... Um, Challenges experience, challenging experiences and the trauma that she's faced um, it's going to have an effect on her so um, yeah, I just yeah. want to really take care of her even if she um, has a different view on things I, I know she wants the best for me um, and I just want to kind of give her a better life really you just want the best for her as well yeah so if there's one message you wanted to say to your mom, what would it be um one message just is, one message like in one line yeah so don't know, how to, don't know if i can put it into one line but i would say that i want her to kind of slow down in life her mind is always ticking and it's never kind of stopped and um with her kind of past life and her she's had not just one marriage she's had two marriages where um, the second individual who she got married to was a white convert and um, he kind of did a lot of bad things to her emotionally um, so um, and financially so she paid off his like he she paid off his debt he had like a £12,000 debt and even throughout um, being with him she paid off you know £5,000 here £8,000 there um, she was paying a lot of his uh, debts off so he's out of the picture now but of course, again, it's had that kind of toll on her where she's had the physical abuse and she's had the emotional abuse now as well. Um, I've grown up with four kids and now she has another one, five. It's not easy. Um, so it's, ne it's been never ending hardships for her. So I just want to, her to get to a point where she can just sit, relax, you know, um, and she's not having to constantly work. I want to give her an easy life, a soft life. That's nice. What, a life that a woman deserves, really. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, any final messages that you want to leave with the audience? Anything you want to say? Just take the floor. It's all yours. Say what you want. A lot of people have excuses and reasons why they can't do X, Y and Z. But instead of finding so many problems and reasons why you can't do something, try find solutions. Um, because more time... A lot of these kind of constraints that people put on themselves, it's more they do it to themselves. They put the box um, on themselves and around themselves and it doesn't even exist. Like, you know, a lot of these things in life um, are kind of structures that have been built, but you can kind of ex escape from them if you choose to make different decisions in life, you know, mm. not accepting... Um, what other people have told you doing what you want to do for yourself instead of listening to um kind of shadowing what the past people have done you know i've never been good at school um and revising um i've never although i was in top sets and stuff um i was never really good at exams i you know i used to fall asleep in my exams and stuff if you believe truly in yourself that you know you don't want to go to university university is not for you and you have a better you have a a more purposeful um kind of mission let's say then go for it don't stop um a lot of people want to kind of be around people because you know i'm feeling some type of pain i want to be around someone that's also feeling some type of pain so we can bond together and just have this kind of like friendship on based on negative emotions, just that we have, you know, um, companionship, um, kind of that, where sorrow, is it, is it sorrow feeds sorrow? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm making sense right now, but um, if, if, if you're around people that are just going to complain, complain and complain, you're going to become a Then you're going to do that as well, yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of boys uh, um, growing up as well, in the, in the same year as me um, they went off and they were really bright people um, A stars you know really good people and then they, they left um, school and they just started hanging around with bums honestly and 
doing that, you've inevitably set yourself up for failure now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, surround yourself with good people. Stop having limitations on yourself. Um, most of these constraints are not even real. You can get past it. Um, so yeah, that's very what impressive. Say. Guys, she's only 21 years old. This <laughs> podcast is supposed to be an hour. I'm sure it's somewhere around two hours, Mark. So very inspirational. I wish you all the best for everything that you do. And stay in touch. And we'll put everything in the description below. Go and show love and go and support her. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me, Abby. No problem. No problem.